this is not going to hopefully talk itself. Won't take that long. Um, and uh, if you, if you don't mind, it's only ten slides, so maybe we'll hold off discussion till the end. Um, hopefully, I'll, and then we can kind of talk it over just so I get through the slides relatively quickly. Um, but this is basically I've been doing some research on high res models and um, actually running local models that way. Uh, and as part of that, I started reading on verification of, of these models by different researchers, particularly at NSSL. And as reading it, it got me thinking that maybe there's a better way to do um, our smarting at our POP um, than what we're currently doing. So that's what this proposal comes from. So next slide. So as probably most of you know, and I guess this is different out west, uh, in the Rockies, but um, our current pop smarting is, is QPF based. So here I've got an example. It's the CMWF from last Friday, um, verifying Sunday 0Z to Sunday 6Z. Um, this is in GFE, so you can look at 0 to 6Z and 6 to 12Z. You can see the precip moving across east, southeastern South Dakota into northern Iowa and southern Minnesota. Next slide. So. What happens then is if we smart knit a pop based on that, and this is a 12-hour pop from 0 to 12Z, and what you can see is, is it looks at almost exactly like the um, QPF, not surprisingly. You get this huge area of 100% over Minnesota and South Dakota, and you get a very tight gradient on the north and the south side where you go from basically categorical to nothing in a matter of probably 10 or 20 miles. So what this really comes up is, is there truly no chance of rain where there's zero QPF? Um, you know, is that what the model's saying? And conversely, is it truly 100% chance of rain anywhere where the 12-hour QPF is greater than a half inch? Um, I would argue that, that that may not be true in both cases, especially in summer with convection. And what that leads me to think is, is does this lead to some, some biases, at least in the, in the models, where we have a wet bias in summer because of course, the convective parameterization pretty quickly will get you to a half inch and any decent type of floor thing. So you can, you can get a lot, much more easily get to 100%. And conversely, do we get a dry bias in winter where um, maybe we're, you, know, you get the snowfall of one to two tenths of an inch water equiv or one to two inches of snow. Every model has it, but that ends up being like a 70% chance or whatever instead of a 100% chance. Again, I realize this is our small all smartiness, but that could be an outcry or an outcome from this way of doing it. Next slide. But but I think even worse than that is that it's actually just affecting the ADJs. So here is the ADJ ECE, not AG, ECM. I'm sorry for that. Um, it's actually the ECE um, for that same period. And what you can see is is you can see some pretty strange outcome because it's using the ECMWF deterministic model smarting it as a first guess field for the ADJ. And so you have here, if you look in northern South Dakota, you see um, a 52% pop by Watertown, um, which is north of our CWA, then basically a zero pop. And then because the ADJ um, ECMWF MOF has a 20 pop in Aberdeen, which is a little bit farther north, you get a bullseye of a 20 up there. And so it's very a very discontinuous field there that's not really realistic with how the pop should really look. Um, and so you end up with these weird uh, numerical um, holes, essentially, in pop. Another thing can happen, next slide, um, is that you, if it locally raises a pop on the edge of the area, you end up with these, these bullseyes, which may be unrealistic. So for example, the ECMWF had a pop of 9% in, in Denison, Iowa, which is, down, which is where the arrow is pointing, or the 12 hour, but the MOF had a 37%. So then it locally raised the pop across that whole neighborhood, and as a result, you get this local bullseye of categorical pop around Dennis, just north of Denison, Iowa. And in fact, it's a higher pop than what ended up being across all of southwest Minnesota um, at that point. So again, you end up with these weird numerical anomalies because of, of how we're, not just with the, with the deterministic model, but with the ADJs as well. Okay, next slide. And then when you go to the high, to the high res models, you end up with a much more noisy field. Now this is actually fairly clean because it was a relatively organized system and it's a three, three hour QPS. 
But this is from the high-res WARF ARW. And you can see at the edges, you end up with very tight gradients. You see these, these fingers that come out from the area of precipitation. And in western Nebraska, you can actually just get these small bullseyes of precipitation. Now, if you go to the HRR and do the one-hour pop, it's even worse, especially in a relatively weakly forced convective environment, um, where you end up with small bullseyes of pops over time, because, because the QPF tends up being very um, showery or very intermittent across the area. Next slide. And just one last example again, and this is from the, the NAM 12. Again, you can see the, the uh, tight gradient um, where you go from basically zero to 100% or near 100% in less than one county. Um, again, remember, this is, this is fourth period. This isn't first period. Um, and so you get a, what I would call a very deterministic looking pop. Um, it looks like the QPF field because that's what it's based on. And you end up with something that's much more deterministic than a probability field really should be, especially as you get out through third or fourth period. Next slide. So in reading the papers, well, wait a second. Um, one of the papers, and this wasn't the paper that completely developed this idea, but they, they explain it really well. It's by Schwartz et al. in Weather and Forecasting. I believe it's February 2010 for those who want to read it. It's something called neighborhood probabilities. And it's on the FEC SSEO already. They do it all the time. And since I actually made this proposal to, or since I've talked to John, I also found out that, that um, Denver office and several offices in Wyoming and Colorado may be doing a very similar type thing. Um, Eric contacted me. Um, but basically what it works is that basically at each grid point, you, come, you draw a circle. And that circle is some, is some radius R. Um, you know, in this case, it's, it's basically two grid boxes, or two and a half grid boxes on this example. And what you do is any grid point that's within that circle, you just count the number of grid points that have QPF. So in this case, on the left, we have eight grid points that have, have a non-zero QPF. So as a result, the pop at the center grid point is 38% instead of what would be a deterministic 0%. So you end up, as you can imagine, you end up with a smoother field. And we'll see that on the next slide. So we can go to that. So this is a paper by, uh, again, from Schwartz et al., another figure from their paper. And they have different radii that they're using. And you can see as, you, as the radius of zero, which is basically the deterministic way, in this case it's exceeding four millimeters of rain in one hour, um, it looks very noisy. It basically looks like a radar picture, um, in essence. As you increase to 25 and then 50, 75, and 125 kilometers, you get more and more smooth feel, a more um, you know, less detail in that field. And so it, it starts going to larger and larger scales. Like in the 0 or 25 kilometer, you may be looking at, the, at like a convective scale or near convective scale. But by the time you get to 125, you're well into the meso-alpha scale, you know, 100 kilometer size system. So it really depends, the detail you want is dependent on the radius chosen. And one can imagine that if we were to go to this, you could have different radii for different days uh, period. So like first period, maybe you do 25 kilometers. But maybe as we get out towards day three, maybe it's out 75 or 100 kilometers. It's something that we can figure out. But it's something that would be consistent for each model that we did. Um, so you'd use the same procedure. OK, final, uh, next slide. So my, my proposal is, is that we could work with NSSL. Well, again, this is before I found out um, Colorado and Wyoming may be doing this. Um, let's work with NSSL to look at a few past cases to see how this new method would compare to the old method. For example, I could get uh, data from several cases that affected much of the region in winter and in summer, load those, that data into GEMPAC, and then, um, and then compute the probability as we currently are doing it and the probability grid as, as do, using a neighborhood probability. And I, I've contacted Dr. Adam Clark on at NSSL to see if I could get hold of some code. And he thought maybe he could get some code from SBC for what they're doing with the um, SSEO. Um, they're also, you know, once we do that, we could have someone much smarter than me program the smarting net that uses neighborhood probabilities instead of the direct QPF or POP. And then from that, we could test out different radii to determine what's the appropriate radius for different time periods. 
Now, again, if, if the Rockies are already doing this, we may be able to compress all these steps or even skip them um, as well. And then once we do it, we could examine the difference between the diff current methodology and the proposed methodology in a few test offices um, in, in the plains or, the, you know, diff like the lakes, the plains, the Mississippi Valley, et cetera. Um, and we can also determine the impact on, on our computer systems since it would, it would be more um, intensive program, a resource intensive than the current methodology. And then if there are no flags and we all agree it works, then we would install a new methodology region-wide at some point in the future. So that's basically my proposal. Um, you know, I, any comments, any questions, uh, whatever, um, feel free to fire away. If you hate it, you can fire away at that, too. Thanks. Yeah, Phil, I think this is a great idea. And uh, especially, I've noted with using the con short, it, a lot of times it's very, um, you know, has a lot of leopard spots, so to speak, and using the neighborhood uh, probability, as you suggest here, should make that a lot more useful. So I'm all for this. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, in Goodland, we're using a, a point-based neighborhood thing that showed some success. That's not nearly as robust as what you proposed there, but uh, I definitely think it's a good idea. And from the two years of data we've had with the point-based stuff, it usually shows skill over just the raw output. Bill, it's Carl. I like it a lot. Um, have you thought any, especially in the shorter room term, is possibly time shifting as well as spatial shifting? Because sometimes, you know, the timing isn't right. And so if you had time shifted it forward back a little in the same way, you might it would smooth the forecast, but it might be a little more usable for what we do. Uh, you, you know, I... That's something Eric brought up to me, and I, and I, th I think that's a, actually is a really good idea with like the HRRR and, and possibly even the like the high res um, ARW and M NMM, um, because you're right, you you can be off a little bit, and the rock 13, you know, in the first 12 hours you do a one hour time shift. I, I think that actually is a good idea. Bill, do you know if Eric is actually doing that? Like, do we have we seen his code in, in action? Or Eric I, I told me I, that they are doing that in Boulder, and, and my understanding was that they might be doing it in Grand Junction and Riverton as well. I'm not sure it's exactly this way. Um, you, you know, I haven't seen it. I have not seen his code, but... Yeah, um, not in Grand so Junction. He, this is Pueblo. We are using it down here, um, and I've looked at the code. And he does also a uh, temporal as well, as well as a spatial averaging. Our forecasters like it as a, as a first guess. Yeah, and he also does some terrain adjustment as well, where um, he may amplify the pops a little bit up in the mountains. Yeah, they use it in Cheyenne here too. Well, maybe it sounds like uh, another first step would be just to to see if we couldn't spread that out to a few more offices. I I talked to Eric a while ago, but I wasn't able able to, ever to ever to actually get my hands on the code. So um, I think. It seems like it, it, it may, if it may have the possibility of helping avoid you know, some redundancy in our work here, um, I'm all for the idea. I think it sounds great. Yeah, I, I think if we can get that, the stuff from the Rockies, I, I agree. I think maybe we could start testing it at other offices. So I think it's a good idea. Um, obviously, the, the way we do smart it's now is not really good for a deterministic model. The, the idea was that if you do, if you average a variety of models, then you hopefully get a little bit less of that issue with, with yes, no. Um, some other things you should probably know that we're, we've tried, but because of the looming AWIPS2 issue, we're really not distributing them. But Jerry has bias corrected pops now, um, which is pretty cool actually. It, you know, a lot of the deterministic models as you get into the extended have zero pops, which is not very realistic and this corrects them and it also corrects the white bias. You know, we haven't been running it very long, but that's that's something else that I think would help with some of these these issues. Um, my again, my feeling all along is 
the way to gen the reason to generate the pops the way we do is is to use them as part of an ensemble, which does smooth out some of these issues. One thing I would caution, though, is we have a fascination, a counterintuitive fascination with smoothing. Uh, on the one hand, I, I hear a lot of offices talking about um, how they don't like detail in the model output, and so they try to smooth it. And then in the next sentence, they complain that models are too smooth and there's not enough detail. Um, the only thing I would caution with this is that is that we make sure that when we're smoothing things out because we like it better or the forecasters like it better, that we're actually determining that it's OK to do that because the skill level is either the same or improves, which I think you're right in the extended. I think, in general, forecasters don't like detail in the grids. Even though they say they do, they go out of their way to, to get rid of it. Now, some again, what you pointed out, I think, very eloquently is that there's a lot of detail put into these adjusted grids caused by artifacts from the, the SERP tool. But again, I, what I've found is it's a culture change that we have to help. We need to make sure that scientifically we're removing detail because it's it has no skill. If it does have skill, which I'm not saying it does, then we have to be careful not to get rid of it just because we, it doesn't look good, if you, if you know what I'm saying. There's a, Jeff, there's actually, there are papers out there that would help us determine what the skill level for, an, for a radius would be appropriate, at least in the short term. No one's done the, the extended, because they're all doing it for high-res models right now. Um, so I think there is a way to, to ensure that, that there, is, there is a way to be scientifically um, uh, rigorous in determining the appropriate radius so that we're, we're forecasting it to detail that, that shows skill without throwing out too much, you know, throwing out useful information. That makes sense. But I, I know I rambled, but I think that this is, this is good stuff, and I really, I really think the SSEO is, is a, has some very nice and realistic fields, and what's nice is that you can click on one field to get a neighborhood probability, which is smoother, and then you can click on max fields that give you a lot more detail. So I think as long as we can preserve it when we need to, this is a fantastic idea. Um, I was wondering if uh, maybe we should present these ideas to the CRG, Matt, since we already have a <clears throat> You know, a group of developers in the Smart Tool Task Force that could handle the coding. We already have a verification side that could probably look at the special verification. And uh, you know, we've us and the CRG Matt have had a nice. I think we have a pretty good way to set up to do tests and get things going. Um, I'm sure we they'd be interested in checking this out. I know we've discussed improving the pop fields before. Um, is this something? To, it's me and Jeff are both members um, that you'd like us to present to them to see if we can get the ball rolling that way, or just go do it on our own. I think we should just schedule Phil to present this to the team, and then we can we should make a decision. And obviously, Kim has seen it now, so I'm guessing Kim would be supportive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, I think it does. It it there's no doubt that end of. What, what you can produce with this is you can produce cleaner fields for deterministic models. So if someone someone want, absolutely wants to use the European POP or the adjusted European POP, I, it, I think it, right as it stands now, it's very difficult to do that without doing a lot of smoothing. And so we might as well do the smoothing intelligently, and this is a perfect way to do that. I agree. I'm, I'll uh, talk to John and some other teammates and see if they can, we can schedule time to get together. If you, and that works for you, Phil, to present to us. Um, 
I'm pretty sure we have enough infrastructure there to get the ball rolling on this pretty well, even if it's just testing out what the mountains are doing and getting it shared with everybody else. Um, look forward to dealing with this. This is kind of interesting stuff. Yeah, Jeremy, I, I can present. Just send me an email. You and Jeff send me an email for a time, and we can coordinate that, and I can present it. Did you guys want me to work with Dr. Clark about seeing if we can do some sort of verification over past events too, you know, using that it would just be the NAM, the GFS, and the Rock. That's all that um, NSS or NCDC archives that I know of. Um, but if you're interested, I can I can check into it and see how long it would take. Or if you don't think we need to do that, I can you know just say we don't need that. Uh, I'd personally be interested in it just because if we tried to verify it through our own means, you know, we'd have to collect all the data, and it'd probably be a year from now before you'd even be able to see any verification data. Um, so if it's possible, I, I I wouldn't mind seeing, but seeing it if it's not too much work. Um, yeah, I'll find I'll find out from at Dr. Clark what how much work it would be, and I'll I'll let you guys know. You know, hopefully I'll have more information by the time of that call. That sounds good to me. Okay. Thanks for putting it together, Phil. Good stuff. Thank you.